Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this, the latest in the series of lunchtime seminars by SRP and AURPO. And I'd like to think that this is probably the best and certainly the most important thing to come out of COVID. Uh, we've been running these since uh, around May last year, and uh, they have proved, I think, an invaluable resource for our members and for others who are not yet members of SRP or AURPO. So um, let me just, uh, without further ado, go through uh, an introduction to, to uh, today uh, and this uh, webinar. The first thing to say is you will have the opportunity to ask questions that will be answered at the end of the presentation. And you can ask those questions through the Q&A box. Uh, if you look at the top of the uh, of your screen, you should find uh, uh, an icon which is a speech bubble with a question mark in it. That's the Q&A uh, box uh, function, so you can use that to ask your questions. And uh, you can also use it to look at other people's questions that have been asked and to like them. And what we'll do is we will try to answer the most liked questions at the end live, and then others that are uh, asked can be answered afterwards uh, and then put on the event page of the SRP website. Um, so also, of course, this uh, webinar can count towards your continued professional development. So please, if you email the code, uh, as you can see there on the screen, to the admin email address at SRP, um, uh, you can claim your uh, uh, one CPD point through an email that you'll receive in, re in reply. The other important thing is to get your feedback, to get your feedback both on how these uh, webinars are, are running, but also um, I, we welcome your suggestions for further subjects for webinars uh, that we can run. Um, and perhaps suggested speakers, if not yourselves. So please do put those suggestions in as, as part of your feedback to us. Um, the next thing I want to uh, say is uh, I'm very pleased that uh, we have chosen to continue this free webinar program for the foreseeable future. You know, this was something that we developed in response to COVID and lockdown and people having to homework and all of that. Um, but we have seen such value to it and, and such a positive response to it that we have decided to continue it. And to that end, the, the working group that have, have been putting these webinars together is now formally a committee uh, within SRP. And we welcome uh, people offering to, to get involved and to join that committee. So if you are interested, please do email the admin email address there. The next thing I want to mention is our uh, SRP magazine, um, our non peer reviewed publication that uh, we've uh, we have started this year. We've had one uh, uh, issue, the launch issue that came out in the summer. We now are working towards the second issue, which will be coming out in December. So do look out for that. Again, we welcome people wanting to propose content, articles, um, and, and to proffer those for the editorial uh, group to, to, to look at um, and consider for publication. And we will move forward uh, uh, to more issues each year, hopefully three or four a year, but at the moment uh, we'll, we'll get this second issue out in December and do take a look at that. Um, the next thing I want to say is, of course, is to invite you to consider, if you're not already a member of uh, SRP, to consider joining SRP. Uh, we have, of course, uh, benefits of membership, including the Society Journal, that, which is the Journal for Radiological Protection, not only Radiation Protection Today, but also weekly uh, newsletter. It does offer various other benefits such as discounted attendance and conferences and the full day virtual events that we are now running as well as face to face events. You do keep up to date with the RP community. You do have access to the job vacancies that we advertise. And of course, you can get more involved as a volunteer through the SRP committees and groups. The other thing I'd like to point out is that uh, there are professional uh, registration status that uh, 
that you can also apply for in parallel to being a member of SRP or indeed IPM or AURPO or any of the other professional bodies through the Radiation Protection Council, you can achieve a professional recognition. And it's not just about chartered status, which is obviously for us more senior and experienced um, professionals. Through your career as you develop, you should consider uh, applying for one of these professional registration status to, to demonstrate your competency at that stage of your career. So please do consider it and there's more details on the website. And now it um, gives me great pleasure to introduce a great friend of mine, Professor Pete Cole, who is a past president of SRP and is the current AURP president and he is going to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, another um, SRP AURPO free lunchtime training webinar. And it gives me great pleasure to be here once again uh, to introduce today's speaker, who is Ross Allen. Ross is a final year PhD student in the nuclear physics group at the University of Birmingham with an interest in nuclear physics and the ability of nuclear power to decarbonize our grid. Ross studied an undergraduate degree in nuclear science and materials before studying a master's in nuclear decommissioning and waste management, both at the University of, Liv of Birmingham. Sorry. Ross then undertook a PhD focusing on the modeling of nuclear reactions with a focus on novel isotope production for tracking of nuclear fuel particles and fission fragment nuclei. So over to Ross at the University of Birmingham. Ross, please. Brilliant, thank you very much for that um, introduction there. I'll just share my screen. Can you see that there? Brilliant, okay. Um, so um, as Pete just said, uh, my name's Ross Allen. I'm a PhD student at the University of Birmingham in the Nuclear Physics Group, and um, I'll be giving this talk today, which is an introduction to nuclear reactors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by giving a little bit of context um, to nuclear energy, a little bit of history, um, where we are today with nuclear power, and then I'm going to move on to more technical details, and we're going to work through a nuclear reactor and the different components and how they come together to create electricity. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion on um, the UK nuclear fleet, um, things that may have not gone quite so right in nuclear energy in the past. And then we're going to move on to finish um, with advancement in the field and where we see the nuclear um, energy industry going in the next coming decades. So here's a timeline um, I produce, so it's not exhaustive and it's really just I've plucked out some things that I find really interesting in the history of nuclear energy. So nuclear physics became a discipline in 1919 when Ernest Rutherford um, discovered that the majority of the mass of an atom was all within, mainly within the nucleus, um, a very small area of the atom. And it was not until 20 years after um, when Lisa Meitner and Otto Frisch discovered nuclear fission. Around that time, we obviously had the start of World War II. And this technology was really pushed um, with the Manhattan Project and um, for nuclear weaponry. And during this, um, there was a lot of understanding of how this could also be used um, for nuclear power and for peaceful purposes. And development went on for another 20 years, roughly. And it wasn't until 1956 that we had our first full scale commercial nuclear reactor. And this is what you see on the left hand side. So that's Calder Hall in the UK. And what you can see in the image there is actually the Queen opening um, that power plant. And I think that really gives you the scale of the nuclear industry, um, that the entire commercial nuclear energy industry can be contained within the time that the Queen has been monarch. Um, as we move forward, nuclear power really started to gain some traction um, with nuclear power plants um, sprouting up all over the world. Um, for example, in 1974, France launched a huge nuclear um, program after um, a big oil shock. 
And after this development, um, and they got these online in 2004, their nuclear program peaked with 75% of their energy coming from nuclear power. Other notable um, points and maybe a more abstract use of um, nuclear energy was in 1977 um, with the launch of Voyager 1, which is a thermonuclear generator using plutonium. And what I think is really interesting about this one is in 2012, this became the first man-made object to enter interstellar space. Um, and this was using nuclear energy to power it. Into the 80s, we started to have fusion research taken seriously with a lot of funding. So we had the Joint European Tokamak opened in Oxford in 1983. And then obviously moving later into that decade, we had Chernobyl, which really um, cast aside the, the great progress that was made in nuclear over the previous decades. And we started to see a slump where people stopped taking nuclear as seriously. Um, and obviously there's, there's many things I've left out in this timeline, you know, over the next few decades, but I've pointed out a couple of things in here, um, which we may touch on later. So for example, in 2007, this is construction started on ITER, um, which is the next development um, on from JET with fusion energy, and this is being constructed in France and it's still under construction. In 2011, in Japan, um, as everyone's well aware, we had the earthquake and tsunami in Fukushima, and we'll touch on this a little bit later. Um, and this was really coming at a time when we had the nuclear renaissance, as, as it's called in the industry. Um, policymakers uh, were really starting to take nuclear seriously as a way to approach net zero. And we'll have a little bit of a discussion about how this timeline may evolve over the coming decades um, as we go through. So where does nuclear sit currently in the global mix? So 10% of global energy comes from nuclear currently, and this is from 445 nuclear reactors currently in 32 different countries. And reactors are being constructed all the time, so we have 50 under construction at the minute. The majority, well, a large um, portion of those coming from China, so we have 14 reactors currently being um, built in China. Um, I don't think the, the global demand for new nuclear is slowing down. Um, with a recent um, report by the Intergovernmental um, Panel on Climate Change um, being very strongly in favour of nuclear um, to assist in our transition to net zero. So if we now bring this in to a more local domain and we just look at the UK, 20% of our energy uh, mix roughly is coming from nuclear power. And this is something that's going to um, dip quite a lot over the next decade. So we've got an aging nuclear fleet. So these are advanced gas reactors, um, which were built several decades ago. And we'll talk, talk a little bit about these more later. And these will all be going offline by about 2030 with only one of our current reactors, um, size all, um, being on until about 2035. Um, we do have two reactors under construction at Hinkley Point C. Uh, which will account for about 7% of the UK's energy when they're online. Um, and we, we're also looking at a couple of other reactors coming online. So one of the main interesting things in the UK is the recent developments in the actual financing of nuclear. So I'm only going to touch on this very briefly, but Hinkley was um, given a lot of, um, had a lot of controversy around the financing. It was using a thing called CFDs, which are contracts for difference. Um, they're very hard to get investment for um, as the investors don't get their money back until the project is fully constructed and um, electricity has been generated. And as you can see on the right hand side, when a consumer is then getting electricity from that, a large proportion, the majority of the cost of that power is actually coming um, from interest on that um, the financing. And it was only last week that the government announced um, RAB, um, which is a regulated asset base um, to be um, legislated for nuclear, um, which allows investors to earn money from the point of construction, which actually brings down the cost um, to around 40 to 60 uh, megawatt uh, pounds per megawatt hour, which is in line with renewables towards the end of the decade. Um, and also this week um, on Tuesday, we had um, the government coming out and um, committing to 210 million pounds of funding towards small modular reactors. So I think in the UK, nuclear power isn't going anywhere. I think if anything, we are coming into this renaissance. I think we're going to have a much greater um, impact. 
So that's a little bit of context and a bit of background. I hope that was useful. So now we're going to move into a bit more technical and actually look at a nuclear plant and what it does. So on the face of it, a nuclear plant acts in a very similar way to any other power plant. You're converting energy into heat. This heat's heating water into steam. This is powering a turbine, which drives a generator. This generator is what's producing electricity on the grid. With nuclear, it's really what's inside of the containment structure which we're interested in, we're going to focus on today. So the containment structure is just a large concrete reinforced structure uh, where all of the nuclear components are. So that's the reactor core and also the primary coolant loop. And these are incredible structures uh, which are designed to withstand um, huge forces of nature and also even malicious attacks. So you can see on the right hand side, this is testing of a, a mock up um, containment wall um, with a fighter jet being um, thrust upon it. Um, so now if we go inside of that containment vessel, what, what's inside of it? So the majority of the, the space is actually taken up by this primary coolant loop. So this is extracting heat from the core of the reactor where we're having fission, extracting that into a heat exchanger where the heat will de be deposited into a secondary coolant loop. And it's this secondary coolant loop which leaves the containment vessel and is what interacts and drives the turbine in a secondary process. Where is this heat coming from? So this heat's coming from predominantly uranium. We sometimes use plutonium and there's talk of um, thorium reactors you may have heard, uh, but I'm going to focus on uranium. In our current reactors, we use ceramic pellets. So these are uranium dioxide, UO2. Um, in previous reactors, um, metallic uranium was used. So this is in the old Magnox reactors um, in the UK, for example. Um, and this did give you a higher density of uranium in your fuel, but you had a lot of, with it being a metal, you had thermal expansion when the reactor heated up and that caused a lot of stress on different components. So having um, a UO2 ceramic, you have a very high melting point and low thermal expansion, which is just what you're looking for. So as you can see in the image, just to the left there, um, you've got these pellets and they're roughly a centimetre in diameter and just over a centimetre in length. Um, it depends on the, the, the reactor, of course. Um, and these are stacked up into fuel rods. Um, and these fuel rods are collected into an assembly. Um, an assembly contains 264 rods, for example, with a PWR. And when you, and, and a reactor will contain a number of assemblies. So I think PWR contains about 193 fuel assemblies in total. Uh, when you add up all of the pellets in there, we're talking in the order of up to about 10 million um, fuel pellets in a reactor. So what's actually going on inside of this fuel to create the energy or convert the energy? So it's the uranium. So we've got two main isotopes of uranium. There's also um, a very, very low abundance um, isotope called 234, uh, which is about 0.005% abundant, but I'm not going to, we're not going to focus on that too much. Um, and you have your very high abundant 238 uranium and a lower abundance 235. And it's this lower abundance 235, which is what we call a fissile isotope. So if a thermal neutron or a neutron of any energy interacts with this nucleus, it may cause a fission. And that's what we're looking for. So a lot of reactors um, use enriched fuel and you'll have heard of enrichment. So what you're trying to do there is increase the proportion of the uranium 235, which is the useful isotope. So we have PWRs at about 3.5% and AG, AGRs as well. It goes up to about 3.5%. Um, um, there are some reactors which don't require enrichment, um, such as the, in Canada, you've got the CANDU, which is the Canadian um, deuterium uranium reactors. Um, and we'll mention a little bit later about why they can get away with um, unenriched fuel. So in the fission process, obviously we've got a uranium-235. As I mentioned, it's interacting with a neutron. Um, there's basically a probability of the neutron interacting and when when you're designing a reactor or running a reactor what you're trying to do is balance the probability of a neutron interacting with one of these uranium nuclei. And this is governed by a thing called a cross-section. So a cross-section we you know um, for all purposes right now we can um, say is a scaled probability. So it's a probability of a, a neutron interacting and causing a fission. 
And if you look on this plot just to the bottom, on the y-axis, we've got the cross section, so the probability, and this is against the neutron energy, so with different uh, changing neutron energies. And what you can see here is at lower energies, we have a much higher probability. So if, if we're designing a reactor, we want to make sure we can slow down these, these neutrons in the system. And I've put a red circle around there, at around 0.025 electron volts, which is what we call a thermal neutron. Um, so that gives you a very high um, cross section and you're likely to have an interaction. So when you have the, these fissions, what do we get out of it? What are the products? So we get a large deposit of energy. So this is per fission, we get about 200 mega electron volts. So I understand that for most people or for some people that electron volts aren't a convenient unit system. Um, so just below it, I've just put a comparison of energy densities. This is just natural uranium um, compared to another common fuel, uh, methane. And you can see where, you know, orders of magnitude um, higher density. Um, as well as the energy, we're getting these neutrons. And this is what's allowing us to sustain um, a um, chain reaction. So one neutron will re interact with um, a uranium nucleus. If that fissions, that will then give off some neutrons and the process continues. As well as this, we get our two fission products, as you know. Um, so energetically, um, due to the charge of the nucleus, you end up with a larger and a smaller component. Um, and you can see that on the plot there. So we've got um, neutron and proton number on, on our X and Y axis. And this is showing that what you see on the on the Z axis is the, the percentage, the probability of, of uh, um, producing these different um, isotopes. So each of the bars there is a, is a different um, element. Um, so I've just pointed out technesium 99 there, which is a, an isotope of interest in spent fuel. Um, yeah. So obviously we've produced our, um, our, we've had our reaction, we've got our neutrons. And as I said, what we want to do is create this chain reaction. But what you want is a stable chain reaction. You want a reaction which is well balanced. You want to make sure generation to generation, you have the same reaction rate. If it starts to go down, you're going to lose power. If it goes up, we're going to have problems with um, overheating. So this can be, um, sort of governed by this equation, so um, the K effective. So we can see this as the number of neutrons in one generation over the number of neutrons in a previous generation. So for a, for a stable reactor, this equals one. So we've got the same number of neutrons in one generation to another. And any deviation from this value being one, we call the reactivity. Um, so this is something I may refer to a little bit as we go through. And there are several different components in the reactor which will affect this reactivity. Um, these include the moderators, the control rods and poisons, and we balance these out to try and keep at this stable rate. So let's talk about moderators first of all. So as we spoke about with the, with the uranium, we're looking to lower the energy of the neutron so we can have a high probability of interaction. So how do you slow down a neutron? So you have a material where you're likely to scatter. So, so your neutron will interact, it will scatter off of um, the atoms within this medium, and it will lose energy in successive scatters, eventually uh, becoming this thermalized or low energy neutron, which has a high probability of interacting with your uranium. One thing we have to watch out for with these moderators is, even though they're scattering our neutron, um, they're lowering the energy just as we desire, um, they have a probability of absorbing the, the neutron. So, for example, if we've got water as a moderator, um, this may absorb our neutron or we may end up with deuterium. And that's lowering our neutron effectivity. So we've got to find a balance there. So there are a couple of materials which are used. So commonly light water, so just H2O is used. Um, but there's a couple of other materials which are, um, have benefits. So, for example, heavy water, so this is with deuterium in place of regular hydrogen in water. And the actual capture cross-section, so the probability of this, this neutron being absorbed is very low, while the scattering is still very high. Um, so this gives us very effective neutrons. One of the downsides to um, heavy water, as you may be aware, is it's very expensive. So this is why a lot of reactors um, don't use it. 
Another um, medium is, is graphite. So this is used in the, for example, in the UK with the um, advanced gas reactors. So they're huge and um, very pure concrete blocks. Um, benefit is it's cheap. It's very easy to produce um, high purity um, graphite. And it's got good thermal properties, so it can absorb heat very well. Some of the issues are it's got a low scattering cross section, so you need quite large volumes of um, graphite to be able to get to the, uh, the level of moderation you want. And also, depending on your, your medium, the, the, you can see an evolution of your graphite over time. So you may have seen in the news over the last few years talk about graphite cracking in reactors um, and, and how this is actually potentially going to bring a lot of the reactors off of line. Um, and this is something that has to be monitored over time and is seen as quite a drawback um, for graphite. So that's one way, you know, moderation is one way to be able to make our neutrons more effective, which allows us to, to, to increase the reactivity. So a way to bring it down, and this is something which is commonly known as control rods. Um, so in this case, you're actually wanting to absorb those neutrons. So this absorption cross section we were talking about, we want to be very high. Um, and there are, there are a few different isotopes and elements which have very high um, capture cross sections. So this is boron, hafnium and cadmium, for example. Um, and once these control rods are dropped into the reactor, um, they'll very quickly absorb the neutron. So this is used for very quick um, changes in reactivity. As well as this sort of quick control within a reactor, there are other ways of controlling a reactor which are much more slow, and this is used in um, sort of chemical addition. So these are what we call reactor poisons. So there are a couple of types. So there are reactor poisons which can be added into the, new, uh, into the reactor. So we've got boronic acid, for example, boron having a very high um, neutron capture cross section. This will absorb a lot of the neutrons, preventing these neutrons from going on and interacting with uranium. And this brings down the reactivity of our reactor. It's also important to note, and this is something that when controlling a nuclear reactor, you've got to find the balance of, is you're going to, uh, some of your fission products are going to actually be um, poisons themselves and they'll be absorbing a lot of the neutrons. Um, and you can see here, for example, so we've got xenon, um, gadolinium and samarium. And the gadolinium 157 cross section um, for absorption is far, far higher than that of the uranium. Um, so if you've got a neutron going through a system, it will be very quickly absorbed by the gadolinium. So in a reactor, the gadolinium will then um, transmute as it absorbs this um, neutron, and you'll basically have a constant production and burn up of this. Um, there are some poisons um, which are also seen as non burnable. Um, so, hafnium, for example, um, has several different stable isotopes. So, as the neutrons are absorbed, you, you keep hafnium and you still have a very high cross section through the different isotopes. Um, so that actually lasts throughout the lifetime of a, rea uh, a reactor's fuel cycle, pretty much. Um, so that kind of covers a few of the different mechanisms you'd use in a reactor um, to bring the reactivity up, to bring it down and try and control it. I hope that gives a, a, a relatively good understanding of how, how a reactor works. So now I'm going to bring us on to the nuclear fleet. So how, do, how, how does our... Um, how do our reactors actually work? So the majority of our reactors, all but one currently, are advanced gas reactors. And this was the next generation on from the old Magnox reactors. And this is a design which is unique to the UK. And the coolant, which is um, passed through the, the fuel um, and then passes around, as you can see in the picture on the right, um, that's made of that's CO2. The benefits of this is because it's a gas, when it heats up, you're not going to have any transition changes. Um, and you also have a very high thermal efficiency, um, which was one of the benefits to it. This reactor is graphite moderated. So I've mentioned that before. So that's, you'll have sort of huge, um, basically bricks of um, graphite inside of the, the reactor core to slow down the neutrons. One of the issues you have, however, is CO2 at high temperatures will react with graphite. Um, so you'll end up with an oxide forming on your graphite 
um, and you'll end up with the carbon dioxide forming into carbon monoxide. Um, so one of the ways this is prevented in the AGRs is they have to um, pass a cool inert gas through the moderator. Um, so that's a way they've been trying to prevent reactions like that. But as I said, these reactors are quite old now and they are starting to crack as, as expected um, over the lifetime of these reactors. Um, and it, this is something that's got to be looked at because if you're if this changes the the way the um, the CO2 flows through the reactor, this may change the ability to cool. Um, if this if the um, graphite expands or um, pushes, it may cause strain on the fuel channel. So this is something which is mon monitored um, constantly. Um, and at the bottom, you can see here this is the um, the scale of one of these reactor cores. So it's about 10 meters by 10 meters and 1,400 tons. So you know it's a huge structure. Um, as I said, these reactors are going offline and we're moving into a, a new age. So we've got um, one reactor currently um, in the UK, which is a PWR, and this is Sizewell. Um, and Hinkley Point C is also under construction, is a, is a variety of um, PWR, which are pressurised water reactors, um, being a subset, which is called a European um, pressurised um, water reactor, EPR. So how does this reactor work? So you have high pressure water, and what this means is because you've got the high pressure, the steam, even if you're running at 315 um, degrees C, as these reactors do um, in the hot legs, so once it's gone through the fuel, um, you're not going to have boiling. So it stays in that same um, liquid state. And if we look at this image, you have, you'll have the core in the center of the reactor, which is in red. The water will pass through there and it passes into these different legs, which are the steam generators. And this is where the heat is exchanged um, into the secondary coolant loop. So we've got three of those on this reactor, as you can see. And then we've also got, if you can see, there's a blue column in there, look, which looks slightly different. And the role of that in this reactor is to maintain that pressure. So if it goes too high, it cools some of the water down, some of the steam turns back into, into water, and this, and this basically alters the pressure to keep it to an optimum level. And I don't see over the next um, number of years, this changing in, in the UK um, will have different designs of PWRs, but I see this is, is where we're going. So for example, um, I spoke about the adaptation of small modular reactors. Um, so this is a, a program which is being run by Rolls-Royce. Um, and they have a lot of experience with PWRs. So these are the, the same style of reactor which you'd have um, in the submarines, which they build. Um, so the SMRs will be much higher, much um, greater power, um, but a similar modified design. And we'll, we'll mention those a little bit later in future advancements. So this is all well and good. Nuclear, as you can see, um, it's an incredible technology with, you know, there's lots going on producing low um, zero carbon energy. But as we know in the past, things haven't always been so perfect. So obviously in 1986, we had Chernobyl. So there are four reactors at the Chernobyl um, Pripyat nuclear power plant. And reactor four, the fourth reactor there, went super critical um, in April of um, 1986. So we're just going to scrape over what happened there. Um, there are a few things I'm going to miss out um, as we're, you know, we this is only an hour's um, webinar, um, but I'm just going to go over the main main points here. And it's important to know that this actually happened during a planned safety test. So they were say, testing the safety of the reactor. So if power went off, if the reactor was shut down, they have backup generators. It would take a number of seconds before these generators come online. And in that time, they wanted to make sure they can keep the coolant pumping around the reactor. So they were looking at using the turbines, the inertia in the turbines to drive these pumps. And this is something they were testing. So there, there was a planned test. They were going to lower the power of the reactor down to 20% and run this test. Kiev called up halfway through this test and asked them to um, to, to maintain 50% power to power the city. So they so there were alterations in the actual schedule, and there are a couple of things this meant. When we were talking earlier about the reactor poison xenon, for example, this changes the level of xenon if if you're bringing the reactor down and keeping it at this level over time. 
This also meant that the, the test was run 12 hours roughly after it was planned. The effect being that the, the shift staff who were um, primed and trained for this test were no longer there. It was a, a different set of um, workers who were running it. It's not 100% certain why the power was brought down so low, but we ended up, the test was run at 7%. The reactor dropped in power, um, mainly due to the, the, one of the factors was the xenon. Um, and to bring the, bring the power back up to 7%, they pulled out the control rods. So in this reactor, there's a statutory minimum that 15 control rods must be inside of the reactor. During this test, only eight of them were actually in the reactor. And what happened is you started to have various effects, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on the actual effects which were going on as it can become quite complex. But we had the reactivity increase um, and the power started to, to jump up. So to counteract this, they inserted the control rods. So this is called a scram where, where you drop the control rods in. One of the many design flaws with the RBMK, which is the, the design of the um, Chernobyl reactor, is these control rods have graphite tips on them. And if you've been listening, we know now that graphite is a moderator material. So this is going to slow down and thermalize our neutrons, making them more effective. So this, along with seven other, several other effects, caused a great increase in power. It was uncontrollable. We went to 100 times peak power in a number of seconds. And it said that there's on top of this reactor, there's a 2000 ton concrete lid. And this was flipped like a coin due to the power. I think it was 300 gigawatts of power was being output by this reactor. Um, so to give you a comparison, the UK runs on about 20 gigawatts. So it's a huge amount of power coming from a single reactor here. And the official line is the reactor was shut down through fuel homogenization and relocation. And what they, this really means is the reactor exploded and fuel was thrust into the air, into the stratosphere and deposited far and wide. The bits of the reactor and the core which were left melted down into the bottom. And you may have seen pictures of this before. It's called the elephant's foot. And it's an incredible, incredibly radioactive area where you've got molten spent fuel down at the bottom. So as you can see, now we're going to talk about Fukushima. So again, a little bit of a morbid conversation. We're talking about another time that nuclear has not necessarily gone, gone too well. And this is far closer. I, you know, I think everyone in this talk will remember Fukushima happening. So the Fukushima Shima, um, Daiichi nuclear plant has six reactors, and these are boiling water reactors. Um, so slightly different to the pressure waters, uh, pressurized water reactor we were talking about with the UK fleet. These reactors were wanting to actually boil the water to actually boil. So at the time of the um, the earthquake on the 11th of March, we had three units operational. So reactors one, two, and three were operational. Reactors four, five, and six were offline for operational maintenance. And we had the earthquake. Power was cut. The reactors shut down as, as planned. Then the tsunami came just after that. And obviously th this came over the wall, over into the plant, and this caused the diesel generators, which were the backup energy, to be destroyed. What we then had is a massive amount of heat buildup um, in the reactor as they weren't, the coolant wasn't being pumped. What was the coolant which was there was evaporating off and we had a big buildup. And this was happening over several days now. And over that time, the fuel was exposed and the cladding, which is um, the material which surrounds the fuel pellets, rose to over 1,100 degrees Celsius. The, the, the water inside of the reactor, we then had hydrolysis and we ended up with a lot of hydrogen. Some of this hydrogen was released from the containment vessel into the reactor building. And we had three explosions at this plant. 
it's important to note, and I think this is something people sometimes um, don't realize, is that it wasn't a nuclear explosion. It was an, an explosion at a nuclear plant, but the, the explosion at Fukushima was a chemical explosion. It was, it was hy a hydrogen explosion. For some of our um, keen-eyed um, watchers, if you remember, I said reactor four was offline. It wasn't running, but reactor four had an explosion. And this is due to common venting between reactors um, three and four, hydrogen passed through, and that's what exploded there. In the first three reactors, we, as well as these explosions, we had hot fuel and the fuel melted. And this is again, creating this, this substance we call um, corium, um, which is a mixture of fuel cladding, of fuel in a molten state, and that dripped through the bottom of the reactor core and since then, it's been found that um, this is contained in a lump within the, the, the concrete base of the um, reactor um, vessel. So there was lots of talk after this accident and as well as Chernobyl. Into how can we make nuclear safe? How, why, what is going wrong and how can we prevent this? So in the UK, for example, um, the Office for Nuclear Regulation stress tested all of our reactors making sure this couldn't happen. And there's a big drive in the nuclear industry for passive safety. What this means is a reactor does not need, need active control. Forces of nature will be able to actually control the reactor using convection, gravity, and negative feedback loops. And that makes the, the reactor inherently safe. You're not requiring a mechanical action or an operator to act to keep the reactor safe. And a lot of this is already implemented in reactors we have. So for example, in a pressurized water reactor, we know that's a moderator, the, the water. If you think if that gets too hot, the water can boil. When that water boils, um, we have a lower density. So the, the moderator acts less effectively. So we have less of these thermal neutrons and our reaction rate will significantly drop. There are lots of new reactors which are looking at passive safety. So the picture on the right is from New Scale, um, which is a company developing a small modular reactor design. And they have their, their re small modular reactor cores submerged in water. If the reactor were to go offline, if there were to be any sort of issue, um, the water would slowly um, evaporate away, extracting some of the heat. And then the reactor can be um, cooled by natural convection of air around the reactor, um, maintaining safety no matter what. So that pretty much takes us through where reactors are today and what we're looking for. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about advancements we have in reactors. So I mentioned these small modular reactors um, and as I said, the UK government have this week put in a commitment um, to fund this. So there was a, a government consortium um, of many different companies, Atkins, um, Rolls-Royce, the National Nuclear Laboratory, for example, who came together over developing this nuclear plant. And this has now moved into the second phase, government funding of 210 million with private backing of over 250 million. And they're looking at getting one of these plants operational by the end of the decade. So they're much smaller in scale compared to a conventional um, large scale reactor. But they're still the, the idea is to get reactors which are able to power um, about a million homes, which is the size of Leeds, which is an, you know, still an incredible uh, amount of clean energy being produced. And as you can see on the on the top right here, we've got a picture of um, this is one of the designs um, for how a plant would um, look that's come from the consortium. And on the bottom here, what we've got, this is a, a PWR steam generator um, being transported by, by lorry. And the idea is that you'd have um, basically factory style system where, where these reactors are um, built inside of a, a factory and they're shipped to site. And what you'll get from this is economies of scale and it brings the price of these reactors down quite dramatically. So yes, so thank you very much for listening.